You're about to meet the man who killed your brother. Yep. What are you feeling? Ah, oh, I feel nervous. Yeah. yeah, very nervous. I mean, he's probably more nervous meeting you than you are meeting him. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Peter Heyman has never met Russell Harrison. In a happier world, their lives would never have crossed. But two years ago, they became tragically entwined. That's when Russell killed a violent home invader. The dead man was Peter's brother. Peter's brother, Adam Slomczewski, was on ice when he broke into this suburban house in Melbourne looking for cash. He was in the middle of ransacking the place when Jessica returned home. We heard screaming and one of our children said, our neighbor is screaming, Dad, you gotta help. They weren't these, uh, ah, I'm hurt. They were like blood curdling screams. It was a true scream that somebody was in trouble. Slomczewski had turned on the young mother in a violent attack. What he didn't count on was this man, a former elite US Special Forces soldier who happened to live across the road. Have you ever killed anyone? Yes, I have, during wartime. How many people? Um, confirmed are 23. As the screaming became louder and more desperate, Russell's training kicked in. He sprinted across the road to Jessica's house. So I jumped over the, this brick wall, went through the back, and the steps going up to the back door, you can see there's a security door. I swung that open. I saw the guy with his hands around Jess's throat, pinned her up against the wall. It took Jess a minute to realize that it was me and not somebody else. And as soon as she did, she screamed, Russell, help. I said, what are you doing? And he let go and took off running through the house. What were his intentions? What was he trying to do? He was trying to kill her, in my mind. Jessica ran out of the house and onto the street. I saw my neighbor running towards me. And um, she was covered in. She was covered in blood from her face. And so I, um, I made her stop and sit down. And she was screaming. Meanwhile, Russell was wrestling with Slomczewski. He eventually got him into a sleeper hold, a choking technique he'd learned in the Special Forces. When he stood up, I was basically behind him. So what I did is I reached around here and I just, and I locked my arm here. And then from that point, I just squeezed on his neck and then yeah, just pushed him down. Yeah, and that was very gentle. Yeah, I can feel it. <laughs> After about 30 seconds, Adam appeared to pass out. A short time later, the police arrived. When the police came in, the first thing they did was check him, and he, the police said, this guy's not breathing. And as soon as I heard that, the first thing I did, I flipped him over and I started CPR. I continued CPR until the police had gotten their gloves on and all that. Um, and then they took me away and then they took over until the paramedics got there. And he died about 10 meters from us right there? He did, right in the living room. Just how far someone can go to protect their home or the home of another is a subject of fierce debate. What constitutes self-defense and how much force is too much? As you'll see tonight, it's a lottery for those who do stand up for themselves. Some are allowed to just get on with their lives. Others are treated like criminals. Ben Rhodes has just walked out of jail for his part in a botched home invasion. 
His limp is a constant reminder of the night he robbed a homeowner of his arsenal of guns. Ben and a friend were high on drugs when they decided to rob this remote rural property. What did you take? We took 19 shotguns. Took them back to my house and we decided to go back basically straight away. Was it? Um, greedy, I suppose. And yeah, it was a really bad decision. A bad decision because when they returned to the property, the homeowner had discovered the break-in and confronted Ben. That homeowner claims that Ben had a loaded firearm and that the gun went off accidentally in a scuffle. Ben tells a different story. I turned around and seen a silhouette, didn't know it was a gun. That was just too quick and just blew my leg clean off. Didn't say a word. Did you know what happened straight away? Um, yeah, yeah, I heard the fire and the pain, you know. Um, I went down into the ground. I tried to stand up a few times and then realised my leg was gone. And I ended up crawling about 50 metres um, into the paddock and laid down there and passed out. Ben pleaded guilty to the robbery and was sentenced to a year and nine months in prison. The judge later downgraded Ben's punishment because of the injuries he sustained in the break-in. Ben says he's been handed a life sentence. Well, everyone's got the right to protect their home and their property but to an extent, you know, like, you, you can't just shoot someone just because they're on your property. People just don't come out and shoot people, especially in Australia. But you were the one who broke in? Yeah, I broke into his home. Who really would have sympathy for a, a home invader? I mean, uh, they are the scourge of society. Why would they ever get sympathy? I think people, most people would applaud when a home invader uh, comes to grief in a situation like that. Criminal barrister Peter Larvac has taken a close look at the rights of homeowners to protect their property and themselves from intruders. A man's home is his castle, and a man is entitled to take whatever steps are necessary to defend that castle protect himself from harm, protect his family from harm. The law in its infinite wisdom gives people the right to do that. But civil libertarians like Pauline Wright argue that an aggressively protective homeowner is no less a criminal than the person who has trespassed on their property. If you or someone broke into my home yeah. and I protected myself, if excessive force was used, is that murder? Yes, you could be charged with murder. If I was breaking into your house and I was leaving with an iPad and you shot me in the back, you would be, I would have thought, prosecuted for murder. Come on, Brad. Um, Push. Come on. Bradley Soper was a giant of a man. Go! Let's go, Brad! A champion weightlifter Come on. Come on. and a respected personal trainer. Number one, make sure you're committed to your goal. Make, to, make sure you're committed to your success. And make sure you're committed to yourself. He was a quiet guy. He was a quiet guy, somebody who always demanded the best out of those around him and always got good results from those around him. Did you ever see an angry side or a violent side to Brad? I, di I didn't see that. I didn't see the anger or the aggression. Come on, come on, Brad. Keep going. But early one morning last February, Bradley Soper broke into a house in Sydney. No one knows what he was doing there. 
Whatever the reason, Bradley Soper was an intimidating figure. So when homeowner Johann Schwartz walked in on him in his lounge room, he was shocked. In the struggle that followed, Soper died. That, in my opinion, was reasonable force. This guy's a big unit, Mr. Soper. Mr. Schwartz was, in fact, in the fight of his life. Somebody sent me the article and said, did you hear what happened with Brad Soper? What went through your mind when you read it? I didn't believe it. I didn't, believe, I didn't believe it because I knew him as a person. I, I didn't see that character, I didn't see that side of him, ever. Former boxer and professional rugby league player Joe Williams trained at Soper's gym in Dubbo. They were local footy heroes and close mates. In trying to understand what happened, what could have been going through his mind? No one's ever gonna know, but I, I feel personally that, that Brad Soper knowingly trying to invade a house He's not the Brad Soper on you. Police questioned Schwartz for several hours. He was released without charge. It's since been revealed that Soper was struggling with mental health issues. There were rumors he was also abusing steroids and cocaine. What do you think about what the homeowner did? I can't sit here for one minute and say that I wouldn't have done the exact same thing. I don't know what happened that morning. Um, there's only two people that do know what happened that morning and one's not around anymore. While Johann Schwartz was quickly cleared of any wrongdoing, it was a different story for Russell Harrison in Melbourne. The local community regarded him as a hero for rescuing his neighbour from a violent home invader. You know, thank goodness he was there because who knows what would have happened. But the police didn't see it that way. There's a number of investigations that have to get carried out, um, not least of which there's a, uh, a post-mortem examination. When they did my fingerprints, the, the charge, they, I watched them type it in, it said murder, and I said, what? He did the right thing. And the man I married is the man that showed up that day. And I'm very proud of him. If it wasn't for Russell, our neighbor would not be here. Her children would not have a mother. The impact of that possible murder charge was devastating and immediate. Russell's security business suffered and the SES volunteer was forced to go on the dole. What's this cost you? Not just financially, but across the board. The main thing that it's affected is the family and my relationship with the family. Um, realistically, I pretty much almost lost my entire family. Um, me and my wife were on the brink of getting a divorce and separating. Because of this? Because of the aftermath of this and, you know, it's just the psychological toll on the family was a lot worse than it was on me. The coroner ultimately found that Slomcheski died of a heart attack caused by a combination of the drugs he had taken and his struggle with Russell. But it took two years before Russell was told he wouldn't be charged. In the States, if you are defending yourself against a home intruder and they end up dead, so sorry, that's, you know, that's your right to defend yourself. In your mind, the laws are, the laws are wrong, as yes. they stand? Yes, 100%. You need to be able to defend yourself, defend someone else, and defend your property without the fear of prosecution from the police. Throughout the battle to clear his name, Russell had one unlikely and most unexpected supporter. Hello, mate. How are you doing? Yeah, Russell. Not too bad. Nice to meet you, Russell. I'm Peter. Hi, Peter. The brother of the man he killed. You've got to do what you've got to do, yeah. you know, and uh, it's not your fault. You know, you're the reason that woman's still alive. You know, and I'm just sorry for what you've been through. I see myself somebody that, okay, this is what any neighbor should do. 
I would like to know that there's someone there to help when, when you need it, you know. Like yeah. if I was in a situation, I, I'd sure as hell would, would appreciate that help, you know. Greatest praise to, to, to you for that. And there's one more twist in this case. One that goes some way to vindicating Russell's actions that day. According to Peter, his brother is a suspect in the murder of another woman. Did it change anything for you? It does, because I know that the streets are safer. I know my family's safer. I know my friends are safer because he's not around. Would you do it again? In the same situation, in a heartbeat. Would have no second doubts. If I ran across that same situation today, I would do it again if I had to. I think he's a hero. I think he's a hero.